Welcome to Franchise Empires, where aspiring entrepreneurs learn exactly what it takes to become a successful franchise owner, from one location to 10 and beyond. I'm the Wolf of Franchises. Everyone, it's the Wolf. Today on the show, I'm super excited to share my conversation with Eric Danver. Eric is a massive multi-unit and multi-brand franchisee. He started with a Papa John's location in 1996 and grew that to 53 locations before selling them all in 2021. Nine years ago, he started building hand in stone massage locations, and today he owns 58 units that generate almost $85 million a year in revenue. And Eric's most recent franchise investment is into Ace Pickleball, the fast growing pickleball franchise that I've spoken about before. I've had the founder on and, you know, I've invested into that franchise myself. During our conversation, Eric shares his journey building Papa John's, why he sold and the struggles restaurant owners face today, as well as why he's super bullish on growing his hand in stone massage portfolio. And of course, why he's excited to be a franchisee of Ace Pickleball and why he decided to jump in. We cover a lot. It's an amazing conversation covering multiple different franchise industries. I think you guys are going to love this. Eric's a real empire builder. Enjoy. The Wolf of Franchises is the CEO of Wolfpack Franchising, as well as a creator at Workweek Media. All opinions expressed by the Wolf and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Wolfpack Franchising or Workweek. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. The Wolf, Workweek and Wolfpack franchising may maintain positions in the franchises discussed on this podcast. All right. Well, this is a massive portfolio, man. You said 96 for the Papa John's? uh, 96. We opened the first one, April 96. Yeah. So what were you doing before that? And what was it in Uh, Jersey where you opened it too? Or were you elsewhere? Yeah. Yeah. We, um... So I was a regional guy for Domino's. I started out with Domino's Pizza ah, in 89 yeah. uh, with two kids making $5 an hour as a manager in training. Yeah. And, um, you know, really always liked food, you know, always liked to rush, was, you know, short order cook as a kid, that kind of thing. So um, went into Domino's, um, loved the brand, loved what I was doing. And, um, you know, became a regional manager, then a corporate operations director. So I worked my way up pretty quick. They were growing so fast then. Yeah. It was floating wolf, you know, where, you know, so it was a good run with them for about, um, six years. And, um, then a small world, a guy that was, um, an accountant for Domino's who used to handle my P and L's and things, uh, was working for a, a small private equity firm in Baltimore. They had done some consulting work with Papa John's, wanted to franchise, but needed an operator. So he said, this is the guy. And one thing led to another. And that's how I met them. And it was a big decision for me at the time. Cause, um, you know, my father always been somebody I go to for advice. And, uh, he said, Eric, you know, you're young, give it a shot. And, um, turned out to be a great thing. So yeah, that's, that's how I got started with the Papa John's. Wow. Okay. Um, so Domino's corporate into owning, yeah. operating uh, a pop Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So it started out as an operating partner for them and then eventually became a full partner over the years, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, we started out with a 12-store development agreement and we ended up opening 20 locations in 40 months. So we were really cranking them out. And then Papa John's International bought us out at the end of 99. So went to work for them for a couple of years as part of that agreement and then ended up buying 10 stores in Delaware and then ended up buying back the stores that I had sold them. Huh. And, uh, so, um, built, built the portfolio up to about 53, we had 53 locations at one time and then, um, you know, bought and sold and then, you know, got out after COVID as I mentioned. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about that. Like that, I guess it was that private equity group you said that started it also. Um, you know, we don't have to get into specifics, but generally like, were they just putting in all the capital and you were the, the person who had to run it all? And that's, that's kind of how the, and I'm sure there's yeah. equity split for your sweat. Yeah. That that's basically the, the gist of, you know, like an operating partner, you know, where they gave you a piece of equity for, you know, you know, they, they put the capital behind it. So, um, it was really two partners. They went out to some friends and raised some money and, you know, um, you know, back then you could build out a Papa John's for 150 K, you know, it was, Holy it was pretty God. cheap, you know? And, um, yeah, so we were just cranking them out, you know, I mean, think about it, 40, you know, 20 units in 40 months, you know, two, you know, one year I opened eight, you know, we were just, you know, killing it. 
from April to the end of December, I opened five that first year, then eight, then I think it was six. And then, um, we were bought out, you know, 40 months, less than four years we were, you know, bought out. So, Jeez. um, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Um, would you, would you, I mean, I think you said after that you eventually like ended up building 10 of your own, um, you know, yeah, we, was that personal so, capital or, you know, yeah, at, or yeah. Different group of investors. You know, we, we obviously had a good track record, got a really retur- good return for our investors when we pulled out. So, um, you know, there was a lot of interest in, you know, putting some money behind us. So we just went out, raised some capital, bought the 10 and then, um, you know, uh, ended up buying New Jersey and Philadelphia, um, from corporate, they had come in, you know, companies come you know these public traded companies there's a you know today it's growth tomorrow it's you know so it kind of changes with the wind so at that time they really wanted to develop a bunch of units in philadelphia and then got in the market found how how tough of a market it is kind of got their teeth kicked in and said you know what we don't really want to be a part of this and um you know i stepped in and you know took them over and you know we bought those stores and ran them for quite a few years what what made you i guess confident uh if, if corporate's having a hard time in in philly in the, in the pizza game you know you, you thought yeah. you'd figure it out obviously the jersey market because i built those the stores and you know had done well with them and um you know i mean listen you know i think um you know knowing the market you know you come out from outside of philly coming to philly it's you know it's different the people are different you know i'm it's kind of where i grew up and you know so i know the lay of the land if you will so um you know it worked out really well how um you know this is interesting because right papa john's such a big brand um you know i haven't had many i had mcdonald's franchise owners on a few weeks ago on the show um but haven't had too many like franchisees of like the publicly traded companies so um you know i mean i guess how much like freedom did you have in the sense of like corporate was struggling, you thought you could go in there. You know, like you said, you you need the lay of the land. Uh, but like, I guess in my in my head, and I bet you other you know some of the listeners' heads, they're probably thinking, "Well, it's Papa John's, the franchise door." Like they're just telling you exactly what you have to do, and you you don't have an inch to like change. So like, w- were you able to do things differently from like a marketing perspective, or like how can you actually like within the 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 boundaries of the franchise agreement? How are you really able to? make a difference where all of a sudden you're not getting your kick your teeth kicked in in philadelphia yeah i mean listen <clears throat> you know i think you talk to any business owner today you know and you ask them what's your biggest challenge they're going to say what it was you know 35 years ago which you know it's you know it's always been the same it's people yeah. you know and hey, there it is that's created today for sure there's yeah. no question you know it's tougher than it's ever been but that same issue has always been there, you know? And so I think, you know, for me, I had a good following of people that, you know, liked working for me that felt like I was, you know, committed to them as well as, you know, their commitment to me. I mean, when I opened my first Papa John's, when I left Domino's, I took six managers with me, which, you know, wasn't, you know, (laughs) wasn't the greatest thing for Domino's, but, you know, I, I had a lot of loyalty. So when I, you know, went back to do Philadelphia, I think people were just, some of the people were still there working for corporate. I mean, to your point, you know, you're really locked into, you know, the marketing, you know, there's only so many things you can do, but operationally, I think is where you can excel and better people, better operations in the pizza delivery business. It's all about speed, efficiency, you know, things like that. So, um, certainly, you know, cost control, all the, you know, all the things that I think we really got good at with our experience. And when you're working for a bigger company, I think people just lose some interest in that. Um, I think that was a big part of it. Amazing. Okay. And that, so that group, uh, you know, that kind of initiative, how big did it get? Uh, so we were up to 53 units. We were doing, you know, about at that time, I think about 45 million, you know, in revenue a year. So we had, we built a nice business, you know, the margins continue to get tighter and tighter over the years, you know, but you know, the early days, you know, these things were really cash cows. I mean, we were putting the key in the door. The brand, you know, the recognition really wasn't there when we first opened our first store. But, you know, again, we had yeah. six guys that knew the pizza delivery business like the back of their hand. 
you know, I really felt at that time, I think there was a huge delta between the Domino's pizza, you know, um, and, and Papa John's pizza, you know, was significantly different. They certainly closed that gap. Um, but it, 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 we knew, I knew from guys that had left Domino's, the train was coming and, you know, uh, the, the pizza was for a chain pizza. It was just really good. And, um, so we just went, yeah, busters, man, people just, you know, that was before social media, of course, but people's word of mouth was just, you know, people loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like your edge was just from your Domino's experience and the team you were able to almost transfer from, from those days. Was it the operationally you just were able to really excel? Yeah. The, the, the model is exactly the same. I mean, you know, it, it, it was a copycat, just a better pizza, you know, and, and look, you know, the founder, John Schneider, the things that he used to say, better ingredients, better pizza. I mean, he absolutely was committed to a quality product pizza and and really went to great lengths to, you know, that differentiator and that quality of food was there. I mean, uh, uh, certainly, yeah. um, again, they I think Domino's did a nice job and, you know, um, you know, making their product a better pizza. But back in those days, it, it was significant. In knowing what you know now, Right. Uh, you, you've mentioned how, I mean, people, sounds like people's always been the, the hardest challenge for a small business owner. Um, obviously true today, but you know, you mentioned like some of the costs to build like that. I mean, 150 K for Papa John's locations, probably 10 to 20 times that today, depending on the market. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think, and, and even like, let's just say it's a new owner who doesn't have experience in the pizza business, like you had coming from Domino's. I mean, is it, I don't know how to ask this other than like, is it, is it worth it? Like that, the investment it takes, you know, for someone to build obviously into multi-units or do you think you were just a, like you had the right experience and you clearly had the, you were a good leader, had the right team to place into this system, but like for the new, for the, someone aspiring to just get into the game you know, from ground zero, it, it, do you think it's a kind of, yeah, horrible? I mean, I always say to people, listen, I don't know where that tipping point is, you know, first off on scale, you know, like getting too big and, right. and you know, there's, there's, you know, profitability, you know, if you start adding overhead, there's a lot of variables into, you know, how big you want to get and what your long-term goals are and your strategies for sure. For someone that's getting into the game, I think for me, a lot of it is timing, you know, is, is when are you getting into the brand? Everybody wants their brand recognition. Everybody wants to get in. Well, guess what? The best territories are sold. They're gone. Yeah. You know, the existing franchisees, if it's a good brand, you know, the organic growth from existing franchisees, they're grabbing up the territory. You know, if these, you know, when you're doing well and they're cash flowing, you know, really well, you're just dumping that money into you know, more units and buying up territory. And if you're not, someone else is in the system. So, you know, I think, you know, for, for Papa John's in particular, and this is just my opinion, you know, I think that train left many, many years ago, you know, it's probably 400 K plus to build one today or, or more. Yeah. I, I don't even know. I haven't built one in a long time, but I know <laughs> the cost of construction, what it is today. So, um, and, and getting that return in the market, so saturated, um, you know, I just, listen, if there was a good trade market, it would have been grabbed up 15 years ago by another franchisee. So, you know, listen, can you as a mom and pop operator come in and do really well with, a, you know, a, a new location? Sure, I, I, it's possible. But, you know, you're going to have to do M&A to really yep. build a big company. Um, it just isn't going to happen organically with a brand that has that many units across the country. So, yep. No, for sure. Um, and and when you uh, exited in 2021, was that uh, to to another bigger franchisee or to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that time we were down to 20 units. Um, you know, we were profitable. Things were were good. You know, and and just the grind of the people. And you know, post COVID, you know, oh. it was. Um, you know, we went through. You know, when. John Schneider made the comments that went out and all the, you know, yep. it just killed uh, the brand. It killed everybody. You know, we got punished, you know, and this is where you learn how reliant you are on your franchisor for so many things, you know, but yeah. certainly when, you know, people don't equate that we're individual business owners and have nothing really to do with that founder and his beliefs or his statements, yep. 
Um, you know, it just, I mean, it was horrible. You know, you couldn't order Papa John's at work. So our day part business went to nothing. You couldn't, our school lunches, the schools cut us off. You know, we had sports uh, partnerships with the Phillies, the Sixers, the Eagles. Each one of them uh, terminated our agreements. You know, so it was just devastating to the brand. So we went through a couple of really hard years. And then I, I certainly, you know, with what happened to a lot of families and people with COVID, I would never want to say there was anything positive that came out of it. But from a business perspective, um, you know, I couldn't have been in two better businesses than, uh, you know, my hand and stone business and my Papa John's business, because we were the experts at delivery, you know. Um, so we did very, very well and then sold post COVID where the ramp you know, the run up was really good on the on the revenue yeah. and got us back to a good position. So wow. quite a roller coaster. I couldn't even Yeah, it truly was. Yeah. Holy crap. Uh well let's talk about hand and stone too. Uh I think it's always interesting. Uh I've noticed this trend. Uh it's obviously not true a hundred percent of the time. You you're one of like what I would call to me an exception where a lot of at least in the franchise realm there's like the food operators where most of them just want to stick in restaurants. Like, you know, they, they're they in Papa John's and maybe they want to go into like Burger King or just, you know, something, some non-competitive but adjacent concept. Um, and then there's other franchise owners who they don't start in food and they are totally fine going into any industry. You know, they can own an Orange Theory and then, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe a massage parlor or uh, a laundromat, you know, anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, they're just in it for the franchise uh, itself. So, um, yeah, what was what was that decision like to get in the hair? Yeah, so you know, I was a client for a couple of years. Um, loved, always been active, always you know, and loved massages, and yeah. just never really had a place that was you know a middle market reasonably priced to get a massage. Um, the Hand and Stone got a gift card, I think, for Christmas or something, and um, went in was a client for a couple of years. My wife was and you know, behind every good man's a better woman. My wife said to me at some point, you know, this might be a good business to get in. And, you know, I love the food business. I love everything about it. You know, I work really well with guys and, you know, it just, you know, everything about it was my wheelhouse. But I have to tell you, you know, after 25 years in that business, you know, as a franchise owner, um, I was really done with food for the most part. You know, it's the margins are just so tough. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many things, just headwind challenges. Um, you know, I think especially on the people side of it, you know, kids don't want to work in QSR anymore. You know, they don't want to work the hours in restaurants, you know, and I just, you know, I never will claim to be the smartest guy in a room, that's for sure. But, you know, uh, instinctively, I just, um, you know, felt like I had to diversify and go to something else. And so when my wife suggested it, I started doing my due diligence, looked at Massage Envy, looked at hand and stone and just felt like clearly from every box, you know, um, the leadership team, you know, the franchisor, um, you know, uh, the, the aesthetic side of the business again, um, you know, had a little bit of an instinct that might be a, a, a differentiator, but not realizing how much of a, a game changer that would be down the road. Um, because it's become 40% of our business now and it's just growing by leaps and bounds, this beauty and wellness stuff, people just, you know, so, so yeah, so started out with a, a development agreement with uh, them and it just been, just love the business, love everything about it. And just, um, it's been great. That's amazing. Um, and, and what, uh, what year did you first get in to hand it some? Yeah. So it's been, it just celebrated nine years in October. So it was, uh, 2015, I opened our first spa down in Northern Virginia and, um, you know, opened a couple of spas and, um, and then started the M and a stuff, you know, and, uh, really, um, uh, you know, grown the business. We're at 58 units. Now we'll do 85 million in revenue this year. Um, so we've built, you know, a, a nice size business and, and, um, you know, my goal is, you know, possibly bring in a partner and, and, um, you know, grow this thing to kind of double in size over the next three, four years. So, um, that's kind of the plan. That's phenomenal. Nine years ago. And wow. Uh, yeah. 17 acquisitions last year, uh, to DeNovo. So we did 19 spas last year. I've got three on the Q1 kind of slowed down a little bit to start our process. Um, 
with the, an IB and, you know, in the midst of that. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, that's phenomenal. I didn't realize how big it was. Um, yeah. I mean, how'd you get Northern Virginia being uh, a New Jersey native? Cause that's, that's a prime, that's like the deep territory for franchises. Well, it's so funny you say this because that's exactly what I thought. You know, this is why I prefaced earlier by saying I'm not the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> so I'll give you, you know, I think whatever concept you're in, you always learn so much. You know, I don't think there could be a more simplistic business than the Papa John's model. You know, there's only so many SKUs, you know, there's just not a lot of product. You know, they've got the QCC you order from. I mean, the POS system's so buttoned up. It's, it's, I mean, it's as simple as it could be, you know, compared to other restaurants, QSRs. Um, and then you go into Hand and Stone and it's, the complexity is, is crazy because of all the moving parts. But I thought, so I knew New Jersey, I knew I wanted to do multi-unit. Yeah. Um, and New Jersey was where the company was founded. So the saturation in the Philadelphia DMA was, you know, pretty saturated. So I, I, again, back to my earlier point is, you know, what territories are left are probably not the premium ones when the brand has kind of built out that market. So I thought, you know, my old, my business partners with my Papa John's um, were down in Baltimore. So they, I knew the real estate a little bit down there. They knew it well. I brought them on kind of on a consulting basis. They got a little bit of equity of my, my business here. Um, so I thought I'm going to go to Baltimore. So I started doing my due diligence and really found out that, um, you know, Northern Virginia real estate was pretty much on par with Baltimore, not much of a difference. So I thought, you know, I want to build a bunch of these. Northern Virginia, everything does great in Northern Virginia. You know, go down the laundry list of food and any concept. It's just, it's a, just, you know, the density, the income, everything's there, right? Well, it turns out that, you know, it's probably my worst market (laughs) Um, because I think we're, Hand in Stone is kind of the sweet spot. The the really high end consumer probably doesn't want a chain, um, you know, uh, concept. Yeah. You know, the women want to be able to say, "I went to, you know, my, you know, I went to Four Seasons or I went to." So um, it just uh, envies do pretty well down there, but um, we've never cracked a code um, to really break through. So it's it's actually, you know, if it wasn't for M and A, I probably wouldn't I, I know i wouldn't be where i am because that's where you know the acquisitions in the carolinas and in florida and tennessee and some of the other states were in eight states so that's um that's been really really helpful for my business model yeah well it's funny as you're saying that that uh telling the story of of the northern virginia market i mean i i realized early on i think it was like season one or two of this podcast uh, I interviewed the two partners who are the Massage Envy franchisees uh, in the Northern Virginia area, um, and they they do they've done pretty pretty phenomenal. And yeah. they started yeah. in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, I think. Um, yeah, it's that their first store is still you know uh, doing the very healthy numbers. They got about five in the area, so yeah, who knows? Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's like Massage Envy country to a degree. I, I mean. Yeah, it's, it, it, in that in this business, a lot of it's tied to again the people, but the massage therapists yes. and getting in them, and they're really tied into the schools. They've done a yeah. great job down there. Actually, one of the franchisees owns a school down That's there. The ones so I talked to, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're filtering their people out. So yeah, you know, we've got some exciting stuff. I've got a JV with a, a guy now opening some schools. So I have one in. That's um, cool. In uh, yeah, we've got one in uh, Tampa opened i've got one in delaware that's opening and one in new jersey i've got a lease out there and some lois out in virginia so nice. we'll see if i can't catch them yeah. all. <laughs> awesome i'm after yeah. them for sure <laughs> that's good. They'll, they'll probably listen to this so that'll be funny um yeah and eric so is, is it is it just you or do you have like a, a right hand person who is with you on like evaluating all these m&a deals and picking new brands or uh are you kind of just you're you're doing i mean i'm sure you've got yeah no we we build a big company now yeah. i mean i've got a chief financial officer that's been with me for years and years um i don't know how she puts up with me <laughs> but she was back with papa john's for years and then transitioned over to this business so she's really critical for me i have a chief operating officer and then we've got two vice president of operations we've got a vp of training we've got a director of aesthetics director of massage a recruiter 
um, five people in our accounting office. So, and then 14 regional managers and then, you know, 58 spa managers. So yeah, we've got, uh, about 1300 employees. So, you know, we've got a big company, so we've got a lot of people behind it, but I handle most of the M and a stuff. You know, I've got the contacts with other franchisees and built good relationships with them. So that's kind of my wheelhouse and, you know, just kind of overseeing the operations and trying to keep my nose out of too much, but stay in it to, uh, you know, to help the team as support as much as I can. Yeah. Well, a, a few questions there. I mean, I think one, just like your take, you know, especially comparing it or, or slash contrasting it right to, uh, the food operations world. I mean, I'm sure people are still your, your biggest problem, quote unquote, right. With, with, yeah. some, but, um, you know, do you feel like I, I'm going to guess the answer is yes, given that you, you've said you're, you're looking to even double, double down on all this. But, you know, can you tell us about like the lack of headwinds, I assume, I guess, with with like maybe whereas, you know, we said, right, younger folks don't want to work in QSR. Um, what, what's is is it easier to uh, attract talent uh, potentially and also just the margins of the business, whereas food and, you know, all the food operators I've spoken to, uh, it just and you've said it right. It keeps getting compressed and harder. harder. Yeah. You know, are you able to like maintain some stability in the margins in this world? Yeah. I mean, listen, the first thing is, you know, the great news is it's it's still a problem, but we don't have a demand problem. We have a supply problem. The massage therapist is the biggest rub in the industry. And some of these schools, you know, are really where we think the key is, you know, where we can develop, you know, if I can, the gentleman that I partnered with, you know, put out 90 students in his school in Jacksonville last year, he's been doing it for 10 years. So he really knows what he's doing. So these satellite schools, if I can pump out 40 MTs a year, it's going to do a couple things. One is it's going to, you know, obviously, uh, you know, allow for more, you know, clients to get in and see us. Um, the demand is just there. I mean, it's it's tremendous. You know, the uh, aesthetic side of the business just keeps growing and growing. We've introduced CryoSkin this year. So just a lot of really tailwind kind of things with comparable sales growth. I mean, what attracted me to... Uh, the hand and stone model from the beginning was really a couple of things. One is the traffic that was still coming. We call them prospects. So it's a number of people coming into the spas that have never been in before in spas at that time that were four or five years old were the most mature spas. And we were seeing these numbers were 70, 80, 100, 120 people are coming in every week, week in, week out that have never tried us before. So I had really, really like that kind of traffic I hadn't really seen in a business where your ticket at that time was 60 bucks or whatever yeah. it was. So, um, so that was attractive. And the other thing was the comparable sales growth because of the membership model and, you know, continuing to grow those membership base on how, um, you know, how much of a ramp up on comp sales, you know, good year in the food business is three, four or 5% positive. You know, these guys were posting double digit growth in these units year after year after year. So, um, that was a big part of what attracted me to the concept, but you know, that the managers are easier to get for sure. I mean, this is a business women and men like to get into because it, it feels fluffy. It's the spa industry, certainly a lot of hard work. I think there's a lot of misconception on how hard it is because our managers really are in the backbone of our company and work so hard for us. But, um, from that vantage point, certainly a tailwind compared to food for sure. And, you know, I think, I've said to many people, you know, when you grow up in food, you learn to control costs. That is your, you know, it's it's food and labor. It's cost of goods and payroll, right? So you really get good at that. And, you know, the low volume learnings that I had in Virginia, um, those spas have certainly built up. But you learn, you know, sales revenue hides a multitude of sins. So when you get good at controlling costs and then you run into a business like this, you just kind of take those strengths with you. So that's been, you know, one of the things that's been positive. So our margins are, you know, uh, on a four wall EBITDA, you know, somewhere 18, 20%, you know, in that range. So much better than my grocery store margins at Papa John's towards the end, you know, (laughs) (laughs) that three, four, 5% was, you know, was tough. Wow. That's phenomenal. Uh, That's what you love to hear, especially yeah, that's everyone's biggest fear, I think, sometimes with the franchise, especially folks newer to it. It's like, you know, there's like, what's my EBITDA after the royalty, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, 
and and it is a it is a ramp up for sure. I mean, we've <clears throat> targeted you know on the M and A side more mature you know spas that are that are already doing significant revenue and, and you know significant cash flow. You know, just in this spirit of transparency, you know that ramp up that first year is painful. The second year gets a little better. You know, it, it's yeah. definitely a concept that takes time. I don't think it's you know a, a European wax center where you you know immediately out of the gate you know you've got you know, it, it takes time to build yeah. for sure. Well, I also want to talk about, uh, cause I think what's pretty clear is, uh, your kind of prowess for M and a within these franchise systems. So, and, you know, we, we, we had someone on a while ago who, um, effectively did that within Wingstop and we've had other franchisees, you know, that's what they do. They, they just, they've worked really hard. Some of them had it. A kind of like an in to the brand that they're a part of others didn't and had to just really fight to like get in front of the franchise or and get an opportunity but uh i guess you know i want to ask you because you even said it's kind of your specialty is like you know networking with the other franchisees i mean you know there's someone listening to this who's a single unit owner of say like a big brand where you know there is a lot of selling happening um how do you actually like yeah, how do you build that relationship, right? And how do you how do you be one of their first phone calls when they're like, "Hey, Eric, you know, I'm looking to sell. Are you interested?" Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, you know, Wolf, I, you know, it's probably the way you know, I, I was raised. You know, it's just being a good person. You know, like I don't, I, I'm very fair in how I deal with people, and you know, I think that's what the success that I've had with, you know, our our, you know, our teams, and and just you know, on the M and A side, is just. You know, um, it, I think it starts with that is, you know, and I go out of my way to try and help people wherever I can. You know, I do a lot of calls where, you know, we're all busy. I don't I don't really want to take the time to help somebody with something. But, you know, people have done it for me my whole career. So, you know, I think it just starts with that. You know, certainly when I'm at all the conferences, I go with a the, the lot of town hall meetings. You know, I just interact with the franchisees and see, is there a way I can help them with, you know, some of my experience when you're new, people were so gracious for me of trying to learn this business, because again, I don't care what you're doing, that learning curve. And that was really, you know, you know, in hindsight, you know, it was just so great in two, three of my kids work for me in the business Two of my two daughters moved to Virginia, opened the first couple stores and learned this business intimately. So I think there's a a process of learning the business and then you get to the point where you're like okay we've got this down now and now uh, smart growth i guess i would call it so yeah. uh, you know i think that's you know um and and look i'm always knocking on doors i texted some guys today that i've been chasing for a year now that you know have some very high volume spas that i'd love to get and just said hey you know sometimes it's timing you know yeah. sometimes you know two managers quit and they're like uh you know and you hit him at the right time. So I just try and stay in touch with people. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd imagine it requires probably a bit of patience too, right? Where you need yeah. that timing. The, 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 the big, the big volume deals do, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. It's funny. Um, and then, you know, e even like, let's say post acquisition, cause I think you said you have locations down to the Carolinas. I mean, w what is that like where, you know, you're based here in the North, you know, the New Jersey, Philly area and, you just become the owner of this business multiple states away. I mean, how do you retain that team, keep people motivated, you know, find a new manager, you know, what is that whole process like? I mean, it's all about the people again, you know, we have the chief operating officer overseeing everything. And then we have the two VPs. So I have a North VP and a South VP. My South VP has Florida, Carolinas, Tennessee, and Virginia. My Northern is Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, so they're overseeing those units and their regional managers and just, um, you know, listen, there is always when you're a mom and pop owner, and this is one of the challenges on the M&A, if I, you know, I do a lot of multi spa deals on M&A, but also I'll do a one off, you know, I've got a one off coming up and then a Tuesday in, in uh, somewhere in uh, the Carolinas. And the disconnect is when you're an owner and you're in your spa all the time, and then we come in as this big company, we used to come in and tell people about all the opportunities that have with us. And what we found out was most of the staff didn't care about opportunities. They just wanted to know, you know, what are you going to do for me? And so as a bigger company, we have advantages where, 
you know, we do a 5% match on our 401k. We pay about 70% of their healthcare benefits if they're full time. We, we do PTO in every state, even in states we're not required to, you know, so we do a lot of things to, to, you know, because we, we can do those things and want to support our teams, um, where a mom and pop owner maybe can't do those things. But the advantage they certainly have is that they're in those spas connecting with those people. So there's definitely a disadvantage to your, to your point, Wolf, where, you know, your state's away and you can't get in. People say to me all the time, you know, some people don't even know me, right? And that's a problem in itself. But, you know, they'll say to me, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. I wish you would come around. People want to see the owner. Yeah. Right? I'm not much to look at, but they they seem to like to, to see me, you know? So, um, you know, so that's disappointing when you can't, you know, see everybody as much as you'd want and things like that. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we have you know, I've always said to my team, you know, we kind of get caught up in the negative where clients are complaining and you kind of get worn down, but there's so many wonderful people working so hard for us day in and day out. And, you know, what's it for me to pick up the phone, call somebody and say, thank you, or be in a location and be able to thank them. And, yeah. um, so that's kind of the downside of it when you get really, you know, large, um, so. for sure, for sure. Um, I also want to talk about Ace Pickleball because I'm super stoked. Yeah, no, Ace. I, I was, I was. Well, let's lead the way. Here. I know, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where I wanted to transition. Um, so yeah, we can just get into it. I mean, um, obviously, right, Papa John's, you got in early, massive brand turns out to be. Uh, Handy Stone, yeah. you were, I'd say, fairly early on the trend nine years ago. Uh, you know, yeah. not not as early maybe as Papa John's, but, um, you know, it, it wasn't. It's, I'd say it's more saturated today in the massage, you know, between, I think there's elements, there's, yeah, there's a few others. Yeah. Massage heights. Yeah. You got a few of them. Yep. There's a few. I mean, but obviously, I mean, you're, uh, Envy and, and Hand and Stone are the big players for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Why, why, uh, and for, for the record, Wolf, yeah. just Hand and Stone's night and day above massage hand me for so many reasons but i'm telling you i did my due diligence and i am telling you hands down Shot. so i just got to get that plug in there yeah no i i <laughs> you man you're company man I like i'm it. a little biased <laughs> but but it's true sure where <laughs> um yeah so uh talk me through ace pickle obviously for listeners who aren't aware uh, i am an investor in that concept so uh anything i say you know it it's not investment advice uh i i have a financial bias as well um so all right got that out of the way uh well good for you because i didn't know that so you you are yeah just a, a smart man so. joe uh yeah obviously i had the opportunity and um yeah we're I, i'm excited i know him super well and and uh knew yeah. the founding team really well so to yep. me obviously it was atypical because normally i would be very hesitant um for a brand that didn't have a corporate location yet but just given their prowess and Again, their experience in big box retail and franchising, like, you know, is so many similarities to what they did with Sky Zone. And then there was really yeah. just a question of how do I feel about pickleball, you know, after all this hype dies down, really, because there's a ton of right. noise around it. But it's like, can there actually be a viable business after it all dies down? And I, I obviously thought the answer is yes. But curious. Yeah. What was your how did you even hear them? How did this all start? Yeah, no, and and you know, you just hit on some of the concerns we had from the beginning. So I, uh, it's me and a couple of good friends that, um, you know, I stumbled upon this. Uh, one of my sold his business a couple times, did very well in the private equity world. You know, selling his business a couple turns and fifty years old, and he's like out of work. You know, and he's like, I want to do something. And I said, Well, you know what? I have this brand that I've been, you know, following a little bit, and I I think we should really look at it. So. You know, our first concerns were, is it like racquetball? Is this going to fizzle out? You know, is this, you know, and the more people we talked to, you know, the more we played, the more we, you know, just looked into it. We just felt it was so different than racquetball and really didn't feel like it's, you know, a, a, a you know, a pie in the sky shot, in a, you know, through the, you know, um, just really felt strongly that this, you know, pickleball's here to stay. And for all the reasons, you know, you know, the indoor courts, just um you know the wear and tear on your knees and joints and you know the the uh wind the the heat yeah. the all the elements of saying you know like where and, and 
you know, the thing we hear more than anything is as people get better and better, and this is so, the demographic's so wide, you know, it's from, I love that, you know, three generations can be playing pickleball, you know, and competing, you know, and um, just so many things that excited us about it. But um, uh, so definitely did our due diligence, looked at a couple other concepts, but I will yeah. tell you that um, we were just really impressed with with Joe and, and these guys, you know, and, and just what they were doing, what they had done, because I think you have to do it to really know um, to be successful at it. So, um, you know, I'll pause there and just say, you know, we we are just really, really excited about this brand and where it's going and what we're doing. So that's that's phenomenal. Yeah, uh, I, I I agree, obviously, as I kind of said, right, the. uh aspect of experience i just think matters a lot here and this especially you know there are a few other concepts so um i really to the operations obviously matter there's a lot of things that matter but um i do think this is like a unique case where speed to market can generate maybe more of an outsized result for the brand so when i looked at ace versus you know the other two players who didn't have franchising experience, it was just to me a no brainer that like, okay, these guys are going to be able to get locations a lot faster and get them open. Um, and you know, to be like almost a national name in pickleball, uh, you know, I think, I think they have a real shot. Yeah, I, I do too. And I, and I'll tell you my, in, you know, again, going back to how reliant you are on your franchise or like it or not, um, you know, was just really uh, the experience that you spoke of and that, you know, we we found was really a big part of this. And, you know, the support along the way, you know, look, it's early in the game. We haven't even opened a location. We've got one under I construction. See. So, you know, I always say I'm from Missouri. Show me, you know, over time. But every indicator we've gotten from these guys has been really, really favorable. Their yeah. real estate department, the guy they have heading up, you know, Diego is just uh, amazing, has so many contacts. And we agree we think first to market's important. We think it's going to be successful. You know, people say to me, like, are you afraid of competition? There's so many coming into the market. And I'm like, the appetite for this sport is so large. I don't care if somebody opens five miles away. And, you know, there's not going to be that many of those boxes available, yep. frankly. So um, we're not, that's not a concern. I, I might get knocked <laughs> upside the head, but at this point, it's not a concern. Um, but the support on the construction side, you know, like this is where, you know, knowing your limitations, right? I, I just have always loved the franchise side of the business because to me, you're paying for brand recognition, you're paying for systems. You know, Ace doesn't have any brand recognition yet, but the systems on the construction side of understanding ceiling heights, understanding, you know, how to, you know, the fencing, the courts, you know, um, just so many things that we've caught already. Well, not we have, they've caught for us to say, hey, you need to do this. Um, you need to do it this way. And having those vendors, you know, like just chasing all that stuff down. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. So, um, you know, it, it's just been really, really good so far. We're a couple of weeks into construction, our first location nice. in Voorhees, New Jersey. We've got, um, yeah, we've got a, a um, come to terms on an LOI in a, in a site in uh, Vernon Hills uh, in Chicago. So we're excited about that. We're hoping to get to lease and get that done, um, you know, pretty quickly. Nothing goes quick in this day and age with permitting and construction, but um, we'll certainly get that unit, you know, that club open this year. Um, and then we're, we have the rights to Orlando. So we're really excited about that market. So, um, yeah, so it's just been great. I mean, these guys have been really, really, they're on it. They have the experience, and, um, you know, we're just, uh, and the buzz already in Voorhees, I mean, I live in this market, and it's like everybody's talking about, you know, how great it's going to be. So we're, we're excited. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll have to, when it opens, I'll have to come down and play. Uh, not too far yeah. for me. Uh, and I love playing pickleball. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, so, yeah, you've got multiple markets. Um, you know, have you, uh, you, do you, did you have, uh, like, um, almost some type of comparison in your mind from like the business model perspective of, um, you know, do you look at like, I mean, I guess handed stone probably has a good number of like members, right. That are just paying for a monthly, yeah. you know, are you, I think of it in that same light of like, this is like a, this, all the gyms, right. It's membership yeah. model yeah. in a bit of respect. 
Yeah, what I love about the membership list, it's, you know, it's like an annuity. I mean, there's a revenue stream. Like I mentioned earlier about COVID, you know, when we went through COVID, we had members that we said to them, you know, listen, you know, we're going to reopen, you know, you don't lose your, your membership, unlike a gym, you know, will you stay with us? And they did. And so that annuity kind of that revenue stream coming in from those members. And the other thing that's been really um, exciting is, you know, these corporate events that they're doing in Roswell, you know, the Roswell spas or the Roswell spa, the Roswell club is just doing gangbusters. Um, you know, yeah, not a, dis- a lot of disclosure about the numbers, but I can tell you really, really exciting what's happening down there. A lot of corporate events. Um, they've had to limit open play now because their capacity already, you know, they, they so all really, really good signs. And, and just to back up for a minute, Wolf, the other thing, I, I do want to point out, you know, is is like, you know, you, you get a little older, you look for signs and things, you've been around the ropes a little bit, you know, and and I will tell you, these guys have been so disciplined. Um, you know, occupancy is your biggest cost in this business. You know, it's it's gonna run, you know, thirty percent somewhere in that range. And um, you know, not a ton of payroll, not a lot of employees, which I'd love. You know, I'd need <laughs> thirty people to run one of these things. Um, yeah. And I think a more mature employee, you know, um, some retired folks that maybe want to run the front desk and sell some memberships, that kind of thing. But yeah. these guys have been so disciplined about not letting us overextend on, you know, gross rent and really like they get it. They get that their franchisees need to make money. And, you know, a lot of times when you're emotionally in something like this and you have a site you want, you're going to push maybe yes. to do something that in time becomes a mistake. And I have to tell you, it was just been really impressed because they're in that that mode where they're trying to grow and the, the more units they get open. So, you know, credit to yeah. them again, all good signs of, you know, like little things that you look for that tell you like this is we're in with the right guys, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's that's great to hear. Now, uh, I think especially, you know, there's probably less experienced folks definitely wouldn't know like what to look for. Um, and, and maybe so guys, listen, I mean, how many franchisors have you known that'll sell franchisees down the road in a New York second for bonuses, you know, stock option, you know, like, I, I mean, it, yeah. mission. Yeah. Every, yep. it, so, you know, yeah. when you get I mean, in with the right folks and they have a long-term strategy and they have, you know, they care about people and they get that they're only as strong as their franchisees and th- and they've been around. Um, and that's what these guys are bringing. So we're excited. Yeah, that's awesome. And now, I mean, I think like just given that yourself and uh, there are a few other franchisees who, uh, I mean, more than a few others, uh, you know, a good handful um, that also come from, you know, some, some pretty successful franchisee, multi-unit yeah. operational backgrounds. So yeah. I think that speaks volumes. For, yeah, for sure. Kind of of the you know what they're all about um wow so you you got a big big few years ahead man i mean we're you're uh doubling uh hand in stone and and building out some ace pickleball location so yeah i'm not uh, done yet i still got some gas left in the tank and i'm having <laughs> a lot of fun my wife tells me i'm crazy but um we have a great <laughs> life and uh and I'm, I'm still really enjoying what i'm doing i love the ch- challenge of opening new units like this and i we're excited about Ace and remain really excited about Hand and Stone. So I, I feel like I'm in with two great brands, which, you know, is just such a big part of, you know, the success really is is the franchisor and being with the right brands. And um, I feel like I'm with two really, really, um, really good ones. So, and Papa John's was too. I, I've been very fortunate, you know. Amazing. Um, and not that that's obviously uh, more than enough for one person's plate, but you know, do you, are you, uh, as you look towards the future, do you think it's just hand and stone and ace for now, or, or are you constantly evaluating? Your well, brand? I look at your stuff, you know, I mean, I'm going to multi-unit franchise conference. I'll kick tires and oh, nice. I did a few Sweet. different things, you know, but, um, you know, I, yeah, my, you know, my pattern has been to get something, to get really good at running it operation, you know, really get it down. I'm not one of these guys that wants to have 10 brands or anything like that. I just, um, you know, it's just a different ownership model. I think, um, you know, some guys are really successful at it and my hat's off to them. Uh, certainly can be done, but you know, my strategy is more of, you know, find something you're, you like, you can get really good at it. And, um, and then, you know, always keep your eyes open. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it seems like you go pretty deep in in the brands. 
you know, versus, as you mentioned, some folks go a little wider, um, whereas you kind of find one, build it up pretty, pretty deeply. So, um, it's clearly working, man. So, uh, congrats to you, man, and all your success. And, um, yeah, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. You as well. I love your podcast. I think you're doing great work. So I appreciate you having me on. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and, uh, you know, really, uh, continued success for you as well. Great stuff. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, if there's, um, is there anywhere online where folks can follow you or just watch your journey? Yeah, like, you yeah. know, our website is, uh, you know, for our spas is, uh, FGG spa LLC.com. So, you know, there's some in- info on the background of our company and some things like that. But, um, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. So, you know, I'll be at multi-unit franchise conference. Um, uh, I've got the other conference coming up in February and, um, where the heck am I going? I don't even know. Um, oh, the IFA? Yeah, the IFA, um, Arizona, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, um, be at that too. I think, um, I think I won an award there this year, which is nice. So nice for the brand. So, um, yeah, yeah. good stuff. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, folks, we'll, we'll plug the, the links to his website and his LinkedIn in the show notes. Um, so you can follow along his hand in stone and ace journey and, and whatever comes next. Um, but yeah, Eric, thanks a lot for uh, coming on the show. It was a pleasure, Wolf. Really nice to meet you. And thanks again. Awesome. Thanks for listening to Franchise Empires. We're coming to you soon with actionable insights to take the next step on your franchise journey. So make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen.